Hai Assalamualaikum and have a very good day to our beloved lecturer Sir Muhammad Munkis and our fellow friends Now we would like to present our study's current issue in auditing on Sharia Audit which is the impact of lack of knowledge and practices in Sharia Audit Okay, before we proceed on presenting, I would like to introduce our group mates, which is the first one, Nur Husna Fikriya Binti Muhammad Hatta. Secondly, Nur Izati Binti Mansur. The third presenter would be Nur Suzana Ria Binti Kalib. Next, Najiha Binti Abdul Latif. Other than that, Nur Shahira Binti Muhammad Sabri. And lastly, would be Nashita Binti Kadi. Next, we go to the content of this study. Number one, the purpose of this study. Number two, the overall Sharia governance framework, SGF. Number three, the introduction to Sharia audit. Number four, case one, Muhammad Alias Ibrahim versus RHB Ben Burhan and Anur. Number five, case two, Tan Sri Abdul Khalid versus Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad. Number six, case three, NK Associates Yang Berhad versus Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad. Number 7, Case 4, Maybank Islamic Berhad versus M10 Builder, Siran Berhad and Anur. 8, Case 5, JRI Resources Siran Berhad versus Kuwait Finance House Malaysia Berhad. Number 9, Issue and Observation. Number 10, The Recommendation. Number 11, The Conclusion. And lastly, we go to the example of Bank Islam Annual Report Year and 2020. Okay, we proceed first with the purpose of this study, which on the Sharia audit. First, we want to find out more information about the responsibilities and functions of Sharia Committee and Sharia Advisory Council (SAC) towards Islamic financial institutions (IFI). Secondly, we want to get in-depth knowledge on Sharia rules and principles to Islamic banking and Sharia auditing, which can be very helpful for our studies. Next is the overall Sharia governance framework. This framework was introduced by Benegara Malaysia in 2011 as important governance to IFI. We go for the definition first. SGF can be defined as the system of corporate control, effective and efficient governance compiled with Sharia guidance, which to assure that all activities are free from the elements riba, maizir and horror. Furthermore, they have been a priority for IFI from the foundation of Islamic finance in Malaysia. SGF are comprised with two components introduced by Benegara. The first component, SAC and BNM, is established in May 1937 as the higher Sharia authority in Islamic finance in Malaysia. They are given the authority to issue resolution for the purpose of Islamic banking and takaful operations besides validating all Islamic banking and takaful products to ensure their compatibility with Sharia principles. Meanwhile, SC or SSB are to perform oversight roles which are Sharia review and Sharia audit and to ensure the disclosure of annual report or written opinion. On that position stated, who is responsible? There are qualified officers which at least to have the qualification on bachelor degree in Usul Fiqh and Fiqh Mu'amalat. Next, Sharia risk management. Why we need them? The purpose is to identify all possible Sharia non compliant risks and take actions to reduce risks. Thank you, Usna. Firstly, you must know what is Sharia Hadith. Well, shar Sharia Hadith is the critical assessment conducted from time to time to provide an independent assessment and objective assurance designed to add value and improve the degree of compliance in relation to IFI or Islamic financial institutions business operations with the main objective of ensuring a sound and effective internal control system for Sharia compliance. Sharia Audit has three levels of approaches. First, Audit of IFI's financial statements. Second, Compliance Audit on organizational structure, people and processes. Lastly, Review of the adequacy of Sharia governance process. Next, I will pass to Susan Aria. 
now I will proceed with the objective. The objective of Sharia audits are to report the findings of Sharia compliance and non-compliance for Islamic organizations. Second, to assess the degree of non-compliance and its effect on the findings of Sharia compliance and IFIs as a whole. And the last objective is to the auditor, Sharia committee and the board of the director should participate to recommend corrective actions, improvement and rectification necessary in order to comply in accordance to related framework and requirement. Okay, next are the prudential guidelines. In conducting Sharia audit, is according with the international guidelines and international accounting and auditing standard which include Islamic Financial Service Board and Accounting and Auditing Organization for Islamic Financial Institution. Now we proceed with the first case, Muhammad Alias Ibrahim vs RHB Pemberhan and Anor. In this case, it's related to buy bitumen Ajil facility, which by the definition as deferred payment seed transaction, which work like a murabaha contract but with payment generally made on a deferred basis. Alias Ibrahim, as the plaintiff, has entered into a sale and purchase agreement for acquiring some properties in Kota Warisan Project and also a building agreement. Then he hired the bank for their financial agreement. In 2004, the bank as first defender granted Alias BBA and cash line facility for the project. But then in 2005, all assets, liabilities and rights were entrusted to Anno. Because of this misunderstanding arise in respect of the facility which the plaintiff filed a lawsuit to declare the facility agreement were void and of no effect. So the issue here is whether the section 56 and 57 of Central Bank Malaysia Act 2009 are inconsistent with the article 1 to 1 subsection 1 of the federal constitution or not or whether Section 56 and 57 can have retrospective effect on the transaction prior to the date the said legislation came into effect or not. Hence, the court held the plaintiff is not entitled to the declaration which he takes and there is no order to cause. Thank you, Snow, for the first case. We move to the second case, Tansri Abdul Khalid versus Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad. Before we proceed, let's recap what is Murabaha. Murabaha is sale and purchase an agreement between a bank and a customer. The Shariah Bank buys the goods required by the customer and then sells at the purchase price plus profit margin agreed between Shariah Bank and the customer. So based on the case, the plaintiff failed to pay the first installment after signing the Murabaha and by Bitaman Ajil, BBA, facility agreement and that the defendant assumed the plaintiff refused to continue the contract. The judge then decided to refer the case to the Sharia Audit Council, SAC, since they do not have expertise in Islamic banking. SAC acknowledged that the case was a BBA contract and that it was a legal contract and advised the court that they could rule in favour of defendant. However, the plaintiff was dissatisfied with the court judgment so he made an appeal and challenged the validity of section 56 and 57 of CBMA 2009. These are the four issues arise in the case. Based on the first case, court held that there are Sharia issues arises in the BBA agreement. Second, court held that referral letter sent to BNF was to request for info on whether there was any ruling by SAC regarding BBA contract. Since there was no prior reference to SSC for the decision, High Court cannot be found to official. Third, now the SSC's ruling is no longer the discretion of the court as it shall bind the decision of the court. Lastly, the court has determined that both sections are not in violation of federal constitution and are therefore legal. Next case, I will pass to Najiha. Thank you, Izati. Next, I will proceed with case 3, MK Association Jet Berhad vs. Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad. The plaintiff was granted an Islamic financing facility premise on by Bitaman Aziz DBA from the defendant upon the term of property purchase agreement, property sales agreement and agency agreement. The plaintiff had breached the very payment agreement, DBA, and the defendant has initiated a suit against the plaintiff to claim the outstanding balance and start with amounting to 
384,268.88 due to late repayment from January 2000 to June 2012. What is start with? Start with is late repayment compensation as imposed by a bank on a defaulting customer who failed to meet his obligation to repay the principal. It was the contention of the plaintiff that since at the time uh, the agreement were executed, the resolution pertaining to Tatwik had not been made by the SEC, Sharia Advisory Council, and the defendant was not entitled to charge Tatwik in the sum of 10,384,260 ringgit and 88 cents. The defendant, however, contended that it had the right to charge Tatwik pursuant to Bank Negara Letter dated 10 December 1998. So, both parties appointed Sharia expert pertaining to Tawi and after view the agreement by the expert, the court made the following order. First, a declaration that the defendant is not entitled to charge Tawi in law. Second, an order for the defendant to return and or pay the plaintiff the sum the defendant had taken as Tawi from the plaintiff, which sum shall be assessed by the court. This was because the respective party could not confirm the actual amount of tawid which was deducted by the defendant and or the actual amount of tawid imposed by the defendant on the plaintiff in their respective evidence. Third, the claim for the interest is denied as this is forbidden in Sharia and Islamic financing framework. And lastly, the cost of 50,000 ringgit which the defendant need to pay to the plaintiff as the sum the plaintiff had to incur for the expenses to engage the service of an expert is allowed. Next, I will pass the presentation to Susan Aria. Thank you. Now we move to the case 4. In this case, Maybank Islamic Barahat is the plaintiff, while the defendant is M10 Builders and John Barahat and Enor. The plaintiff granted the first defendant with Murabaha Overdraft Facility or MOD Facility for 3 million through a letter of offer first LO. And the parties executed an agreement of asset purchase agreement, which is APA and Asset Sales Agreement ESA, with the first defendant for purchasing the rights title, interest, and benefit of the customer. However, the MOD facility was restricted to 5 million with the terms that the payment need to be settled in lump sum within 12 month financing period for 4 parcels of land that purchased by a defendant. Due to the defendant failed to pay the outstanding amount due, the plaintiff decided to terminate the MOD facility and proceed to claim the outstanding amount due of that facility. Then, the defendant counterclaimed against plaintiff due to the damages for an alleged wrongful and unilateral reductions of MOD facility. So, the issue is the action from the High Court charge decided to dismiss the plaintiff's claims on the ground that the agreement of MOD facility was failed to fulfill the requirement of Sharia compliance under the Murabaha guidelines as there is no new ASA and APA executed for the MOD. And the High Court concluded that the asset used in MOD facility and the first and second LO are safe. And then uh, the second ground is there is no right of plaintiff to claim the tawid. So in this case, the court held that the asset under the ASA and APA executed for MOD facility under the first and second LO are different. According to the Sharia concept, the same asset can be repurchased or resold since the transaction of the MOD facility is under the Murabaha contract and also known as Al Bayina. Al Bayina means that the sale and buyback of an asset for a higher price than that for the for which the seller originally sold it. Therefore, the court allowed the plaintiff to exercise their right to charge Tawid and had reserved its right to claim for Tawid in the event of uh, in the event of a default. Uh, for the next case, I will pass the presentation to the next presenter.
Thank you, Susan Aria. Now, we proceed with our last case, JR Resources versus Wet Finance House, Malaysia Berhad. So, in 2008, Wet Finance House, Malaysia Berhad purchased vessels from a third party at the request of JRI and KFH became the owner of the vessel and leased the vessel to JRI. On 2nd September 2013, Quick Finance House Malaysia Berhad had filed an action in the High Court against JRI Resources Senior Berhad and its guarantor for default in payment on ijara facilities and a Murabaha Tawaru contract financing facility provided by KFH to JRI. After the High Court granted summary judgment in favour KFH, JRI appealed to the Court of Appeals submitting in the earlier that the High Court had erred in not seeking a ruling on whether a cost in the ijara facilities agreement was Sharia compliance in accordance with the Section 56 of CBA. The Court of Appeal and Direct the matters be referred to the SAC, which provided a ruling that the clause was Sharia compliance. GRI subsequently filed an application for a reference to the Federal Court for a determination as to whether Section 56 and 57 of the CBMA were constitutionally valid. The High Court dismissed GRI application, but the Court of Appeal allowed GRI's appeal and ordered the High Court to make the reference. The issue in this case is raised when GRI challenged the rules of SAC in the Federal Court. The specific question raised for the determination by the Federal Court was whether Section 56 and 57 of the CBMA 2009 are unconstitutional for removing discretion of the court as to the need for expert evidence on the subject matters and making the expert opinion of the SAC binding on court. That's all from me. I'll pass the presentation to Nashita. Thank you, Nashara Minti Mamasari. My name is Nashita Binti Kadir and I would like to proceed on the issue the observations from the five cases. As we all know, the major issue in Sharia auditing is the lack of knowledge and the capability in understanding the Sharia regulation. This is because of without the right knowledge, certain party will take advantage during the business dealing. Why? Why this can happen in the real world? This is because of the regulations is not specific and also is not clear for the certain situations. As we can see from the five cases, the judge have limited knowledge because they need to refer SAC before they make the decisions of judgment. This misunderstanding of Shara regulation will lead to some issue, such as number one, the effective date of Shara regulation will lead to dispute between parties. Number two, refer to section 56. 57 and 58 of CBMA 2009 the responsibility and the function of SEC has been challenged number 3 the concept of Tawit is not clear in the case number 4 refer to case number 3 which is the Ben Islam also applying conventional framework in financing business and lastly Islamic financial institutions are using the Arab words for their product which lead to window dressing next we proceed to the big challenges of Sharia auditors in performing their duties. As the issue highlighted before, it gave a big challenge for the Sharia auditors to perform their function. The example of the challenges are Number 1. Insufficient Accounting Standard for Sharia Auditing Practice this is because of the Islamic financial institution has mixed up the conventional standard and also Sharia regulations which lead to the misinterpretations of Sharia rulings. 
Not only that, this also could offer legitimate to against the Sharia standard. Number two, unqualified to become Sharia auditors because of lack of knowledge. The Sharia auditor not only focusing on the transparency of the financial report, but also need to ensure that the fund of the Islamic financial institutions has been neutralized properly. Number three, the lack of accountability of Sharia auditors. This need to overcome by the Sharia auditor as they not only accountable for the human or the stakeholder, but also they need to accountable for a war. And lastly, which is number four, is lack of independency of Sharia auditors. This need to overcome to avoid the misconceptions of the function of SSB and the Sharia auditors in a Islamic financial institution where they pay off to conduct their work. That's all for me. I will pass my presentation back to Nur Shaharia Binti Muhammad Sabri. Thank you. Thank you, Nashita. Now we're moving on to the recommendation. There are a few recommendations on enhancing Sharia and other practice in Malaysia. Since current Islamic finance in Malaysia is not yet in the maturity stage due to the lack of Sharia knowledge and capability of the individual from the finance field. So, for those contracts which are not meeting the current Sharia standard, parties that involved in the contract should review and renegotiate the existing contract to ensure it is complied with the Sharia standard. Next, higher education should consider providing program on giving undergraduate degree students more Sharia knowledge along with the Sharia accounting, corporate governance with specifically to meet IFIS practice. This can help them in becoming a good Sharia auditor that can help strengthening the Islamic finance in Malaysia. The third recommendation is the government should take action to encourage more employees from Islamic finance to work in the government organization. This will make a big change since their involvement will influence the whole organization itself where it can minimize fraud or crimes such as transactions that contain rebuff. The fourth one, industry players should attend seminar or workshop. This can help in improving the Islamic finance in Malaysia since they can exchange ideas and discuss issues related to the implementation of Islamic finance in Malaysia besides gaining more knowledge on Sharia audit. The last one is the IFIL should formulate structured capability development program to ensure that they can understand their function and roles in the IFIS. That's all from me. I'll pass the presentation to Najiha. Thank you, Shahira. For the conclusion of this study, without sufficient knowledge, skills and capabilities, it will give negative impact to Islamic finance, as this will lead to the contribution of window dressing. The image of the IFI will be disrupted as the consumers will no longer believe the service offered by the IFI. In other words, Sharia auditors will face immense challenges from the top management who are only think on how to maximize their own profits and interests without consider the faith and practice to implement Islamic principles in their daily life. Lack of competency would also lead to the problems in effectiveness and inefficiency of implement implementing the Sharia audit framework. Nevertheless, the cooperation between the Sharia experts and the auditors is possible in making the success implementation of Sharia auditing process. Next, I will pass to Izati for the example. Thank you, Najiha, for the conclusion. As you can see here, these are the examples that disclose Sharia Advisory and Sharia Committee. And that's all from us. Thank you.